Good morning. Let's go ahead and begin this morning by opening up our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2 is where we'll be for our message on this Lord's Day. Uh, as you're turning there, I just want to extend uh, another welcome to those who are here this morning, those that uh, are visiting with us. We're thankful for that. To those that are watching us online, we're grateful that you're here. And would invite you, if you find yourself in the DFW Metroplex, to visit with us. We would love to connect with you and, and get to know you more and tell you more about us, about Christ, about the community. So Ephesians chapter 2, we're going to be briefly looking at verses 1 through 9. Uh, but while we're going through that, I want us to focus uh, and keep in the back of our minds the two words with which verse 4 opens. But God. But God. Now, there are two simple words. Right? You see them up there on the screen, very simple. But at the same time, they're actually very profound. Uh, because for the Christian, they act as a reminder of where we were before Christ. And at the same time, they tell us what we are now in possession of as Christians. For the alien sinner, the one, the alien sinner, not the Christian who has sometimes uh, or somehow lost their way, but for the one who has never obeyed the gospel, it, it tells them this is where you currently are. But it also says that there is hope in Christ and the glory of God. So at their core, these terms, they express that our condition, it's not without hope, and it can be changed through the intervention of a merciful God. So let's, this morning, go ahead and read through these nine verses, but always keeping in our mind, but God. Beginning in verse 1, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works, so that no one may boast. We realize that the apostle is speaking to the congregation in Ephesus, those who have been converted and, and brought out of the world. But in these verses is the condition of the unrepentant man or woman. Now, that is the, when I say the unrepentant man or woman, I'm speaking not only of the one who has never obeyed the gospel, but I'm also talking about the Christian who is living openly in sin, and they choose not to repent of their sin. It may be the case in which someone in this very audience is living this morning. There is certainly someone who is watching this online or will watch it in another state or another country where they're still dead in sin and yet they walk through this world as though there is nothing wrong. They are what we would call the living dead. Okay, so if you're a George Romero fan, I'm not talking about zombies, okay? Right, just so you know. They are the living dead, though. And herein is the intriguing thought of this first verse. They were dead in trespasses and sins. So what's the difference? When we hear trespasses and sins, is there a difference at all? 
Well, according to 1 John 3 in verse 4, sin is a transgression of the law. That, that much is clear. But any time that we're going through Scripture and we're studying it, we have to consider not just the immediate verse. We need that context and what's going on there. But we also have to consider the context of that verse in the chapter, in the entire book, and in the whole of Scripture. That's the only way that we can really understand what it is that's happening. And when we consider the context of our reading this morning in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, Paul is addressing two different things. He isn't just using synonyms to stress his point. Now, if you're in the habit of daily Bible reading, or maybe you're one that have, has read through the Bible several times, then you notice that there are certain words and phrases that God will use over and over and over again to stress his point. Sometimes doing it even in the same chapter. That's not what Paul is doing here. Consider that in the Old Testament of the sacrifices mentioned in Leviticus chapters 1 through 5, is that there is in Leviticus 4 the sin offering. And in Leviticus 5 there is the guilt or the trespass offering. Now, even if you were to read Leviticus 4 and 5 right next to each other, one right after the other, is that it would appear that they're actually talking about the same thing because of the, the literary terms that's used. That's sometimes, a, a, I don't want to say a fault with the Hebraic language, but maybe a confusing point. Uh, that because things overlap, you might think, oh, well, it's the same thing. And it's actually not. However, in the sin offering in Leviticus 4, uh, that's primarily dealing with those sins that were committed against God. Whereas the trespass offering in Leviticus 5 is those sins really dealing with man. You can look at it this way. Leviticus 4, the sin offering, kind of looks at the first five of the Ten Commandments dealing with God. And the second offering deals with the remaining five that are interaction with man. So we kind of have that in our mind. We've got trespasses, we've got sins, but really how does that translate to what Paul is saying to those here in Ephesus as well as us today in the DFW Metroplex in 2020? You know, how, how, do, how do we move from there thousands of years ago with Moses uh, to, and then to Paul and then to us? Well, what are the two high commands do you remember, is that the young teacher, he went to Christ and he said, you know, what is, what is the greatest of the commands? And Christ said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. And the second is like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself in Matthew 22 verses 36 through 40. So we've got these two great commands, these two high commands. To be dead in trespasses and sins is to not be following either one of those commands. You see, any good that we can do from a godly point of view can only be done through Christ. Now, I realize that there are people that go out in the world and, and they clothe the poor, they, they help the sick, they feed the hungry. Uh, are those things that help the individual? Absolutely. Do they lift up the community? Certainly. Uh, it, it does, does it make us feel good? Yeah, of, of course it does. I think anybody who has helped someone else knows that it kind of gives you a warm, fuzzy feeling when you're doing something good for, for someone else, right? But if it's not motivated by our love for Christ, then it is, as the preacher said, vanity. And here's the reason why is because we're acting then by the standards of the world. And we're doing it for our own praise. We're not, Paul says at the beginning, and that's what Paul says at the beginning in verse 2, in which you once walked following the course of this world. So, sure, there are people doing a lot of great things, and I commend them for it. But ultimately, the good that you do, if you're not motivated by Christ, if you're not doing it in Christ... Then, it, then what help is that to your salvation? We have the apostle telling the congregation of their former life while at the same time saying to the sinner, this is where you are. You are dead. 
And you're dead because you sinned both against God and against man. And you sinned against God because you're following the course of this world. But God makes us alive in Christ. What exactly, though, is the course of this world that we who are Christians were following and those who are not Christians are currently following? Well, in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 12, it reveals that there is a spirit of the world. Now, the spirit of the world that it's talking about there, it's not, you know, a spirit that goes to God or, or anything. That's not what it is. The spirit is its attitude, its motivation, its tendency, its inclination. And the world, which is, according to verse 2, following the prince of the power of the air, is not inclined toward God, nor does it seek godly things. It's, it's the complete opposite. Romans 8 and verse 7 reads, For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. To follow, Christ, to follow the world is to set yourself as an enemy of the cross of Christ. James 4 and verse 4 reads, Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Now, many people are going to say, you know, I'm not God's enemy. I don't have any problems with God at all. He, he minds his own business and stays out of my life. I, I stay out of his way. Everything's fine. It's not that simple, though. And, and if that's the attitude that someone has, then it's because they've been tricked. You know, they've been duped or hoodwinked by what Revelation 12 and verse 9 calls, he was called the devil and Satan, that ancient serpent, the deceiver of the whole world. And in, in your heart, if that's your attitude, because of the deceiver, you follow the course of the world. That's what he's saying here. So, uh, you know... You're dead in your trespasses and sins. Remember, Christians, this is where you were. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. Uh, those that are not Christians, that is where you currently are. You're dead in your trespasses and sins because you're living by the standards of the world. You're carrying out the desires uh, of the world. James 8 and verse 44, what do these desires do? You are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. Now... Don't get mad at Mike for saying that. Because I know that there are people who are saying, you know, Mike, he got up in the pulpit on Sunday and he just called me the son of the devil. He just said, I, I was just following the devil. No, uh, that's, that's what Christ said. Now, because Christ said it, I believe it. Because Christ said it, I agree with it. If you're outside of Christ and still claiming to love God, then, then you've bought into the lie and are following the attitude and morality of the world, are led by the devil, and are dead in your sin. But God makes us alive with Christ. And, and even though I just said that, or repeated what God has said. Although that might be the current state of your soul, I don't want you to lose hope. Whether you are the Christian that has uh, fallen away and are coming back, and let's face it, just because you're here in the pews doesn't mean you haven't fallen away. There are people who have drifted away from God and yet still come to services, still put on the appearance, right? I think we're all, I think we're all adult enough to, to know that. But you don't have to lose hope because we all, verse 3, once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. Christians are not perfect. We never have been. And if that is the impression that you have received because of the attitude of those Christians around you, whether you're here in the audience or whether you're watching this, then on behalf of all Christians everywhere, I apologize. 
sometimes we can get that way. We're not perfect. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every last one of us. Our goal as Christians has never been to make ourselves appear to be superior. That was the goal of the Pharisee. To walk around as though they were better than everyone else, that they knew more than everyone else. And that they had some special connection with God. Now, don't get me wrong. Christians do have a connection with God that non-Christians do not. But that doesn't make us perfect. That doesn't make us better than anyone in this room or anyone watching. It makes us saved. It makes us part of the body of Christ. And one day we will be perfected in Christ. Our desire is not, it should, it's not or it shouldn't be the desire of the Pharisee. Ours is to let our light shine before men so that they may see our good works and give glory to our Father who is in heaven. That's what our goal is. That's why earlier when I was talking about being motivated... And that if we're not motivated by Christ and we're just doing these things, but people do, and people see it, and they, give us, and they give who praise for it? If they don't know that we're a Christian, they're giving us the praise. You know, oh, so-and-so did this, or she did that, or he did that. Or... But if it's because we're motivated by Christ, then people will know, I do these things because I serve a God who has given me so much. And in Mark chapter 10, verse 18, Christ says, there's no one good but God alone. And I believe we who are Christians can sometimes forget that. Jesus knew that we would sometimes get a big head about it as well. That's why he said over in Luke 17 and verse 10, when you have done all that you were commanded... Say we are unworthy servants, we have only done what was our duty, or what we were commanded to do, depending on your translation. When people seeing us doing those good things, if they have no idea what the source of our motivation is, we get the praise. However, if they know that we're Christians, if we've spoken about Christ, if we know that we're motivated, well, you know, why do you do this? Because I serve a great God who has given me so much, and he commands me to do these things. That's why I, I, I do it. Well, praise God for you, right? Thank God that you're doing such and such a work. Because if you weren't, no one else was. Some of you may have already heard that. Thank, thank the good Lord, is how my mom would put it. Thank the good Lord that you're doing this. Because no one else was. Well, that right there is blatant praise of God, is it not? But again, you're, uh, you're not alone if that is the lost state of your soul. And I can't express that enough because you have to know and understand that. Everyone begins apart from God. Everyone starts their journey uh, differently. The key is finding the God of the Bible and embracing what he has said in this most holiest of books and becoming obedient to what it says. Now... When I say that everyone, that, that you have to find the God of the Bible, that everyone starts their journey differently, let me be clear about something. You cannot pick up the Quran and find the God of the Bible. Okay? The God of the Muslim is not the God of the Christian. Okay? You can't pick up the Bhagavad Gita and read that, the Hindu text, and find the God of the Bible. They're not the same. I'm talking about people start at different points in their life. They started from different backgrounds. They have different experiences. The goal is to get to the God of the Bible. Everyone is in the same law state before coming to Christ, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. The passions of the flesh, the desires of the body, they're evidenced not only by the culture, but by the individual. Now, Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 11 that these desires of the mind, the passions of the body, that they wage war against the soul. 
And you might even be asking yourself, well, since everyone is different, since everyone comes from different backgrounds and has had different experiences, then how can I know what the passions of the flesh are? Because after all, if we look out in, in the world today, there are certain places where things are legal in one area, but they're not legal in another because this society considers it moral and this is immoral. And, and so, so what, what are those things? Just Can you just tell me? Well, Paul explains that the passions of the flesh are the desires of the body and the mind. Okay, now the desires are things that are in opposition to the will of God and they lead towards sin. But it's not what I consider sin. It's not what you consider sin, but what God considers sin, right? And so we can see it more clearly in Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 19, Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. So you know how sometimes we'll go through and even as parents we'll tell our children, okay, I need you to do this, 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 and then we maybe leave something out and they'll say, well, you didn't tell me I had to do that. You know, you told me to clean the bathroom, and so, you know, I did the sink, I did the mirrors, and I took out the trash, but you didn't clean me to do the toilet or, or the shower, so I didn't do it. Even though we're thinking they understood. So, so in this writing here to those in Galatia, Paul lists out several specific things, but then he says, and things like these. So even though I may not have mentioned it, if, if you see that it is kind of leading under this umbrella term then that would be an issue. For example, he, he doesn't, in, in this here, he doesn't mention adultery, right? So if we just went by this list, it's like, okay, well, sexual immorality. That, that could be that, uh, that maybe people are having uh, marital relations before they're actually married or, or, you know, that they're living together or whatever the case. Well, adultery fall, falls under sexual immorality, does it not? Well, I mean, we can't try to go with the Bill Clinton excuse here. I know some of the young ones are like, who? But all of these things are easy to understand. And yet often we don't want to. And the reason is because we are, by nature, verse 3, children of wrath. That's the default position of man, that we are, by nature, the, the natural position under God's wrath. Each one of us is naturally inclined to do that which pleases ourselves and not God. Uh, if you're unsure as to what I mean, think about it for a moment. That's why we teach our children to play nice. It's why we teach them how to apologize, how, how to share, and so on, because those things don't come naturally. It's the same reason that we have classes and things that teach people how to worship God, how to become obedient to the gospel, why we do certain things, like singing without uh, you know, mechanical instruments and, and so on, because it doesn't come naturally. Because naturally, we're looking out for number one and not God. And anyone who is not looking out for God first is under God's wrath. Jesus put it this way in Matthew 10 and verse 37, Whoever loves the father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Over in Luke 9 and verse 62, he says, No man having set his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. And in Matthew 6, the early portion of verse 24, it says, No one can serve two masters. He'll either love one or hate the other, or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. Now, if we just think about those three verses, he's not telling, for example, that you can't love your parents or that you can't love your children. You can't love them more than God is what he's saying. And if we look at these three verses, and what he said is that you can't put people before God. You can't put your regrets of what you left behind before God. You can't put your possessions before God. Nothing comes before God. Now, those are just three 
of over 100 verses that are listed throughout the two testaments in telling us to put God first. And if anyone or anything else is set before God, you will lose your soul. I want you to think about that. Just, just take maybe 10 seconds, 10 or 15 seconds to just look around you. The pews, the people, the lights. When you leave this earth, everything we know is gone. It's comfortable, sure. Decorative, yeah. But in the end, do these pews matter? Does the type of car we drive matter? Does the house that we have matter? Just, just think about that, that it all whoo, vanishes. But God makes us alive in Christ. Why does he do it, though? Because he's rich in mercy. Look at Psalm 145 in verse 9. It says, The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. I personally believe that God made everything. Mainly because I believe the Bible, and the Bible says that he made everything. You ever see the bumper sticker? I believe in the Big Bang. God said it, and bang, it happened. Right? Yeah, so I'm kind of, kind of going with that here. So his mercy is over all. All that he has made, and it's there for the best of us and the worst of us. So the question does, becomes, how do we access that mercy? Well, Hebrews 4 and verse 16, draw near to the throne of grace, receive mercy. Hebrews 4 and verse 16. Now, I did say that God's mercy is there for the best of us and the worst, but let me clarify something. It isn't there for everyone. Now, I know that initially that might sound like a contradiction, but let me explain. The person who will not humbly come before the throne of God, there is no mercy for them. The end of, that individual is still a child of wrath, following the course of this world, giving in to the desires and passions of the flesh, the body, the mind, and, and what have you. The mercy is there, but we have to approach the throne for it. We can't get it anywhere else. And for the person who doesn't come to God through Christ, there's no mercy on them at the judgment. Mercy belongs to God, Daniel 9 and verse 9. And Romans 9, 15 says, He will have mercy on whom He will have mercy. He gets that right. Why does God do it? Because He's rich in mercy and because of the great love with which He loved us. So where are we? As we start to close, where are we? Well, if you're not in Christ, then you are carrying out the desires of the body which are in opposition to Christ. If you aren't in Christ, then you are under the wrath of God. If you aren't in Christ, then you are spiritually dead. But God is rich in mercy, has a great love, has an immeasurable grace and will make you alive in Christ. How does that happen? How do you go from one who is lost to one who is found, so to speak? And again, I'm not just talking to the person who is not yet a Christian. I'm talking to those who are Christians and are drifting away. Don't think that just because you have a title doesn't mean you can't be lost. I could say that I'm Superman and claim the title, but if I jump on this, off this roof, ooh, I am not flying anywhere but to the ground. And fast. How do we go from that lost state to one who is found? So look at these next verses. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It's the gift of God. Not a result of works so that no one may boast. Recognize first you can't do it on your own. None of us can. Not a single person who is a Christian is a Christian because of anything that they did. We cannot 
do it ourselves. It's not your own doing. This is the, not a result of works. If you think you, that you can do anything, then that's going to be a problem. Because if you could save yourself, you would save yourself. And if you could save yourself, then you wouldn't need God. It is the power of God for salvation, Romans 1 and verse 16. Grace is the gift of God. Remember Hebrews 4 and verse 16, you must approach the throne. So maybe you're here today and you are not yet a Christian and you wonder, well, how is it that... I become one. How is it that I am added to the Lord's church? Well, the first thing that you have to do is to hear the Word of God. You can't sit there and read all of these self-help books, even if they've got Bible, Scripture, God, Jesus, or what have you in the title. You know? It has to come through the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. That faith is belief. You hear the Word of God. It develops a belief in you. But you know, belief isn't enough. Because the Bible says that even the demons believe and tremble. Yet, would anyone here say that a demon is saved? In the gospel accounts, is that we have even the demons, it's not just that they believe, they even confessed and said, what do you have to do with us, son of God? So you do have to hear, but you have to believe what you hear. And you have to repent. And repentance, that is the one thing that we keep doing. We keep hearing the Word. We keep believing the Word. We keep repenting of those sins that we committed. But, but if you're not a Christian, then repentance is necessary. And that's saying that I don't want my former life. It's not just changing your opinion. It's changing your heart. It's changing your mind. It's changing your actions. Remember Luke 9 and verse 62, no man sitting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Repentance means I'm following Christ. I'm denying myself, taking up my cross, following Christ, and I'm not looking back at what I've lost because really I haven't lost anything. And confess when Jesus stepped upon the shores of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I am? Some say you're Elijah, some Jeremiah, or Isaiah, Jeremiah, one of the prophets, John the Baptist maybe. Who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he said, Bless you, Simon, for Jonah flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And upon this rock, not upon Peter, upon his confession, I will build my church, my church. You must confess that Jesus Christ is the risen Son of the living God. And then what? Because hearing it's not enough. Belief isn't enough. Repentance isn't enough. Confession's not enough. You have to be baptized. You know, in Acts chapter 2, they were all together with one accord in that upper room, and suddenly there came a sound of a rushing mighty wind, and it appeared in them cloven tongues like fire and sat on each of them, and they all began to speak in these other languages. And Peter's the sermon that we have recorded, and at the end in verse 38, he said, Men and brethren, what do we need to do? And he says, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, the, the forgiveness, the passing over. The pass over when the blood covered the house. You have to be baptized. You will not find a conversion in the book of Acts that does not include baptism. And that's not enough. You know, anybody can get wet. Re Revelation 2 and verse 10, there are going to be trials and tribulations, but you have to remain faithful. James chapter 1 says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the trying of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect, lacking nothing. But you know what? Sometimes we don't know what to do when we're in trials. Whether we're a Christian or whether we're not, we just don't know where to turn. James says, but let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect. But if any of you lack wisdom, if any of you aren't sure how to deal with it, if, if you're in Christ and you just don't know where to turn, let him ask of God, who gives to everyone liberally, and he doesn't hold anything back. Remain faithful, Revelation 2 and verse 10. 
and you will receive the crown of life. This morning, Christians, we need to be reminded of where we were and what we have gained. And because of what we have gained, go out and share that message. To those that may be here who are not yet Christians, realize where you are in a state only belonging to God's wrath. But God makes us alive in Christ. If there's anything at all that we can do to help you in your walk with the Lord, if you need to be baptized, the water's ready. Anything at all, please make it known by coming forward as together we stand and as we sing.